family and fellow soldiers, I'm the Professor, and this is the Moment of Truth. One of the big questions that gets asked of the black media is, what about the Black-Brown Alliance? That's a question that gets asked all the time, and why it is that practically everybody in the black media says that such a thing doesn't exist. Well, let me go ahead and give you an example. In Los Angeles, on the night of November 13th, 2020, at about 10 o'clock p.m., Evan Campbell and his brother had just parked outside their home when they were approached by four men. Antonio Yanez, whose street name was Tank, George Little Vampy Hernandez, his brother Jesus Hernandez, and Justin Ortega, nicknamed Hitta. So you got Chicano gang members running around with these black-sounding street names. All right. As these three strangers came closer, one of them flashed gang signs and another asked, what's your problem? What are you doing here? The neighborhood the Campbells lived in was also an area that a gang calling itself Gardena 13 considered to be their turf. Gardena 13, just like all the gangs in Southern California, answers to the so-called Mexican Mafia. But the ties go deeper than that. A special agent with Homeland Security said in an affidavit that members of Gardena 13 pay taxes to the Mexican Mafia and are believed to be trafficking methamphetamine to associates in Hawaii and importing ghost guns, that is, firearms assembled from unregistered and untraceable parts to Southern California from Las Vegas. In fact, when Evan Campbell's murderers were arrested, police found that four of the three handguns that were recovered were ghost guns. Look, we live here, Campbell's brother said. We don't gang bang, we mind our own business, we stay over here. Y'all go back around to that corner. Campbell then texted his father, Lester Campbell, who's a retired Homeland Security agent who was inside of the house, and he told him that there was trouble and asked him to bring his gun. One of the men who approached the Campbell brothers was identified as George Hernandez. He decided at this point to take a swing at Evan Campbell, who swung back. Then all three of these Chicano gang members pulled out guns. Campbell's father ran outside with his gun, just as Campbell's brother ran toward the family's home. The father told investigators that he heard between 15 to 20 shots. George Hernandez opened fire at Campbell's father, and he fired back, hitting him in the head and the chest, according to the affidavit. As I stated earlier, the father here, Lester Campbell, he's a retired Homeland Security agent. He fatally wounded one of his son's attackers when he returned fire in the ensuing gun battle. At that point, Mr. Campbell ran over to his son, Evan, who was lying outside their home, hit ten times in the chest, stomach, and back. Paramedics declared Evan dead 20 minutes later. George Hernandez was lying in the street about 50 feet away, grievously wounded. He would die at the hospital three days later. The police found Jesus Hernandez that night hiding behind lawn furniture and trash cans in the backyard of a neighboring home. As they handcuffed him, the officers noted Yanez hiding in the same yard. His gray sweatshirt and hands covered in blood, according to the affidavit. Four days after the murder, agents learned that Justin Ortega had booked a one-way flight to Guadalajara, Mexico. His flight was about to depart from LAX when agents apprehended him at the airport. He appeared to be wearing the same hat worn in the video of the murder. On a side note, Ortega and Yanez had been arrested previously on suspicion of murder, but not charged. This was in a separate incident, by the way. So these gang members are freely bouncing across the border with Mexico. This is why so many people are more than a little suspicious about that whole DACA thing. Because people claim that they're trying to get away from these countries and they don't know anyone there and have no connection to those places. But whenever they get in trouble or want to visit family, they happily and immediately go right back with no problems at all. And you have people with the nerve to say that black people shouldn't have any problem with the border being wide open like it is. Now, to continue, prosecutors played a recording of Justin Ortega taken after his arrest. It was a recording of him speaking with an undercover informant that he thought was a fellow gang member. On the recording, Ortega admitted to shooting Evan Campbell, saying, quote, I hit him for sure. Now, what needs to be noted here, and the reason that I made this the subject of this morning's briefing, is that the white media went way out of their way to downplay the race of the victim. They didn't want to have to describe this guy at all. Pictures all but unheard of. But for the one or two who did do a blink and you'll miss it mention of him, they admitted that Evan Campbell and his family are black. But they mentioned that like it's a meaningless detail. It's a CYA maneuver so the white media can cover itself, just in case anybody says, why didn't you say he was black? Well, we mentioned it once and then moved on. Prosecutors said that Evan Campbell was murdered because he was seen as disrespecting this Chicano street gang. And what was the gesture of disrespect? Being black and having the audacity to live in this Mexican street gang's turf. Now, when the gang members were interrogated, you can probably guess what kind of version of the events they gave total lies. They claimed that the Campbell brothers were the aggressors, that they had been playing loud music in their car. 
These four killers also claimed that one of the people in the car yelled out the window, what the F are you looking at? Surveillance video shows that the windows of the Campbell's car were rolled up. And one more thing, it's inconceivable that a Latino gang would be upset about someone playing their music loud. Have you heard how loud they played their music in these Hispanic barrios in LA, New York, Dallas, and Miami? Ears splitting levels at all hours of the day. So they were upset about someone playing loud music, really? Keep in mind, that's the exact same lie that the murderer of Jordan Russell Davis used to try to justify that killing as well. We'll continue with the moment of truth in just a moment, but first, a word from the official sponsor of Black Empowerment, Power Tools. There's no telling when something's going to come up, so make sure you carry your power tools at all times. You never know when you're going to need to bring the hammer down, or when you'll have some trash that needs to be blown away, or some obstacle that requires cutting down. Don't get caught empty-handed. Keep your hammer close by. Keep that leaf blower at the ready, and always carry your steel. Power tools. Because no matter what your day job or side hustle may be, there's no excuse for not being ready to put in some work. Now, something else that needs to be noted here is that none of these murders was actually charged with murder. Instead, the feds decided to treat this as just a basic racketeering case, as if these guys had stolen cigarettes off a delivery truck or something, and they didn't treat it like the murder of a black man that it actually was. Justin Artiga would be found guilty of one count of violent crime in aid of racketeering. Yanez pleaded guilty to a charge of violent crime in aid of racketeering, using and carrying a firearm in furtherance of a crime of violence resulting in death, and being a felon in possession of a firearm. Hernandez pleaded guilty to one count of being a felon in possession of a firearm and ammunition. So you have a clear-cut, indisputable case of murder, one where the prosecutors are guaranteed to get a conviction, they have the murderer confessing on audio recording, and the feds don't bring murder charges. Antonio Yanez pleaded guilty in February 2023. He has yet to be sentenced. As a condition of his pleading guilty, Yanez demanded that the feds drop the death penalty request, which they promptly did. So once again, the Biden DOJ prefers to make deals with race murderers, even when they have slam-dunk guaranteed convictions. Remember, Biden was the guy who ranted and raved all throughout the 80s and 90s about how the criminal justice system was just too soft on these criminals. He needed to be harder. He was sick and tired of hearing about that somebody's a minority and they should get off the hook. Of course, what he meant was black. That's what he actually meant. Now, out of the three murderers, only one of them has been sentenced so far, Jesus Hernandez, who got a measly nine years in prison, to be followed by three years of supervised release. Ortega went on trial, and it took a jury about two hours to find him guilty of a violent crime in aid of racketeering, and he's set to be sentenced in September. Now, keep in mind, this happened for one reason and one reason only, because the Campbells are black, and they live for years in the heart of what was considered to be Gardena 13 turf. Now, this gang, which of course their very name is meant to be reminiscent of MS-13, the Central American gang infamous for their savage violence, these guys answer to the Mexican mafia. But at no point did you see a big deal being made about this. Nobody was pointing out, hey, well in that case then maybe there needs to be a war on these mafia types, right? They're like, oh, well, we got a few of their guys in prison, and that's pretty much all we need to do. Whenever you hear black people talking about folks coming to the U.S. and they immigrate here from anti-black racist cultures and countries... This is what we mean. Artiga, he was on the first thing smoking, ready to go back to Mexico. Why do you think that was? Because he knew that he would be given safe harbor and passage, even if everybody knew about his crimes. You could go ahead and put it all over Mexican television. They would probably treat him as a returning hero. That's the culture down there. People don't like to say it, but it's a fact. So when you see the racist Latino members of the LA City Council, the ugly truth is they're not alone. They're not some anomaly. And they're not simply speaking for themselves either. As the black media, we've reported for years how these racists from south of the border target black Americans and how the authorities allow them to do it. And even if they get caught, the authorities give them a slap on the wrist. This is why an anti-black hate crime law is so important. And this is also the reason why all these other groups are opposed to it. They can agree on an LGBT bill, on an Asian hate crime law, on an anti-Semitism law. But whenever someone dares to bring up the fact that the nation's oldest and overwhelming majority of hate crimes victims are black, suddenly everybody's opposed to the idea. Oh, that's just a little bit too redundant. We don't need to do all that. When you have Mexican gangs coming here and they're carrying out violent killings in the streets and the authorities are simply letting them do it, it's time to recognize we're up against an organized offense. We have the right to defend ourselves. 
And truth be told, Lester Campbell gave a potent example of how to carry out an organized defense in the face of anti-black violence. Two young men sitting in the driveway of their own home, ambushed and attacked by these racists from south of the border. Sounds just like what happened to the family of John White in New York State, doesn't it? And countless examples from across the country. That's because everyone understands the rules of racism, and that under white supremacy, black people are the primary target that everyone's invited to attack. Well, as black people, we need to get serious about making sure that we are not soft targets. We gotta be realistic about that. Nobody's coming to our aid mainly because there are a lot of folks here who like it exactly the way that it is. We have a right to be safe in the streets, at our jobs, and certainly in our homes. And if you got folks out there who have decided that they're going to make it a habit to try to attack black people anywhere, anytime, we are well within our rights to make sure they are stopped. Period. Good day, and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Eric Bailey, Tyrone Leak, Linda Cruz, Turk McKenzie, and Connie Beasley. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black Empowerment only exists because of you.